Well, good morning, El Paso, and welcome again to Fresh Vision Church. Today we're going to be starting Luke chapter 18, and I've titled this morning's message, The Vitality of Prayer and Childlike Faith. Lord Chesterfield, the English statesman, wrote, Learning is only to be acquired by reading men and studying all the various editions of them. Now, although he was referring to the knowledge of the world, what he said applies to spiritual knowledge as well. Many of us can learn a lot from reading the book of humanity, whether in daily life, history, biography, or even fiction. This is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to read books. But not only that, but to talk to people from different faiths and cultures. You see, it's important to educate yourselves about the people who've overcome adversity and helped shape history, regardless of whether they're Christian or not. Well, what we're about to see in this chapter are several editions of humanity, and each one will have a spiritual lesson to teach us. In the passages that we're going to be looking at today, the Lord Jesus will do this by using widows and politicians, Pharisees and tax collectors, and little children to continue to show his disciples about living life as a true follower. So here are just some of the main lessons we're going to be learning about this morning. The vitality of persistent prayer, humility, and the nature and power of childlike faith. So before we get into God's word, let's ask him to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this morning. I pray for those that are watching and hearing this message. I pray that they will be blessed. I pray that they will hear from you. So fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, to deliver your message powerfully and unashamedly and remove all distractions so that everyone's focus will be completely on you. Lord, we want to glorify you this morning. We want to praise you this morning. So speak to us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And the Word of God says, Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who did not fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust, the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to, to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith. Will he find faith on earth? This story about the widow and this politician, this judge, shows us how the vitality of persistent prayer trusts God to supply our needs. In spite of all the interruptions from the crowds and from his opponents, Jesus regularly turned back to teach his disciples, to teach them new truths about the kingdom. In this particular instance, he was teaching them on the need for them to pray always and not give up. He wanted them to understand that prayer isn't supposed to be a one quick session where you can just list your needs and expect immediate results. Rather, he wanted to show them that prayer is talking to God consistently, persistently, and expectantly. You see, because prayer is based on absolute faith in God, it never gives up. And it also knows and it believes that God will answer when and where he chooses. Now, as Christians, we need to be aware as well that Jesus 
did it mean that we should always have our knees bent and our eyes closed in prayer? That's not what he's saying here. However, we must always be in what is sometimes called a spirit of prayer. Paul mentioned this idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, when he wrote, Pray without ceasing. It's hard to measure how much good constant prayer would do and how much bad it would keep us from. As John Bunyan famously said, prayer will make a man cease from sin or sin will entice man to cease from prayer. So in order to explain this principle, Jesus uses another parable that illustrates what persistent prayer looks like. He begins by telling us about an emotionally passive judge who settled cases in a certain town. He did so without care, compassion, or sympathy for either party. And decisions were made on the basis of his own wisdom and power. Now we know this because the Lord tells us that he didn't fear God or respect people. So in these respects, he was completely unlike God. This judge, however, met his match when a widow in that town kept coming to him pleading for justice in a dispute against an adversary. In that day, widows usually had a difficult time making ends meet, so they often received special protection and care from the justice system. But it seems like this wasn't the case with this particular widow. Now, although the nature of her grievance is really irrelevant to this story, the point here was that she was persistent. We see that no matter how long the judge was unwilling to help her or how long he denied her plea, she kept coming to him, asking for justice. Well, one day the judge threw his hands up in disgust and frustration but again, not because he feared God or respected anyone, but because she kept pestering him and his patience had reached its limit. So he finally gave in and gave her the justice she wanted for no other reason but just to get rid of her. Now it's hard not to look at these first few verses and not think about what's been going on in America and around the world for the past couple of weeks. In various cities across this country, people are demanding justice after seeing a defenseless man die under the knee of a man with authority. As a result, people are angry and exercising the First Amendment right to protest and publicly air their grievances. Many have said they won't stop until change happens and true justice is served. On this, I have no issue with. Time will tell how this will happen and what that's going to look like. But what breaks my heart is seeing the evil, the hate, the vitriol in people and the images of chaos and destruction. Now how should we as Christians, as born again believers, react or respond to the injustice that occurred and also what we've been seeing on TV and on social media. Well, honestly, there's a lot and I can spend the entire hour here talking about the things that we, we should do and the things we can do. But to keep it within the context of our passage here, what we can do is pray persistently and ceaselessly, whether it be for justice or for change, or for peace, or for all three. Now, if you think that sounds naive, if you think that sounds impractical, or it's ineffectual, then you don't know God, or the power of prayer. But if you do know Him, then you'll agree with the words found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me say this one last thing before I move on. As a believer, you have every right to go out there and protest and 
to also share your grievances. And I, and I hope that while you'll do that, that you'll do it with a heart of love and compassion and, and not participate in the hate. But let me say this. You'll be more effective on your knees in prayer than on your knees in front of a police line. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Well, in verses 6 through 8, Jesus then applied the story for his disciples. If an unjust judge would act on behalf of a poor widow because of her non-stop persistence, how much more will a truly just God grant justice to his own elect? Now the Lord probably had in mind the prayers of persecuted believers throughout the church age. Past, present, and future Christians who'd long for justice and who'd cry out day and night for God to avenge them and to deal with their persecutors. He then assures them that the day is coming when his spirit will no longer strive with men and then he will swiftly grant them justice. The promise here is not necessarily for speedy but for timely answers to prayer. The Lord Jesus closed the parable with the question, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will you find faith on earth? Now, he could be implying that when he returns, genuine faith will be rare on earth. So let me ask you, if he came today, what do you think the answer would be? Will you find the kind of genuine faith that the poor widow had? Or will you find a faith so shallow that persistent prayer has become extinct. Well, we'll certainly find out when he comes, but in the meantime, each of us should be stimulated to the kind of faith that cries to God night and day. That way, as the world is crumbling around us, when he does return, he'll find his people where they ought to be in prayer. So, in this parable, Jesus taught that God isn't badgered by prayer, but that those who pray, His own elect, should do so constantly, persistently, and expectantly. For those who pray this way, answers will come, maybe not as soon as they want or expect, but when they come, they'll be understood as having come right on time. Jesus also uses his account of the widow to teach what our attitude should be in prayer. But notice that he gave this parable not so much as a parallel, but as a contrast. Because in all reality, our situation is, is different. First of all, we appear not before an unjust judge, but before a loving Father. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father in heaven, the concept of God as Father was foreign to Jews. But Paul would go on to address God as Abba, as Papa, as Daddy in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Thus, far from being our judge, God is our loving Father, our Abba, our Papa, our Daddy. Second, we appear before God not as strangers, but as His children. A photographer captured on film Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia on his chambers at his massive desk when one of his grandchildren came bursting into his room or into the room. The, pho the photograph shows Scalia looking up and smiling from ear to ear. It's amazing the access a person has with his parents. No matter how important a man might be, his son or daughter can burst into his presence anytime. That's the privilege we have as children of the God of this universe. A third, this woman was a widow. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 it says that we're a bride. Do you see the big difference? A widow feels all alone, but not so a bride. Fourth, a widow went alone, but According to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, 
we have an advocate with the Father. We can therefore be assured that while we pray, Jesus is there standing right beside us. And lastly, to get help, the widow went to a court of law. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, however, we come to a throne of grace. Well, in the next parable that we're about to read, the Lord will use an incident that he may have seen in the temple to show us what humility looks like. So let's go to verse 9 here in our chapter and continue reading. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. He also told them this parable to show them who trusted it. He also, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. As verse 1 says, this parable is primarily addressed to those who trusted in themselves on being righteous and looked down on everyone else. So Jesus uses the example of two men who went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Hearing the word Pharisee, the crowd would have had two reactions, that this was a religious man who kept all the rules and he was also someone who regularly opposed Jesus. But upon hearing the other character, the tax collector, the audience would have felt disgust and betrayal. Why? Because he was someone working for a government system that not only was oppressing them, but was also taking their money, giving it to Rome, and pocketing extra that he took for himself. Well, the Lord then put both of their characters on display by revealing their prayers. Although the Pharisee went through the motions of prayer, he really wasn't speaking to God. He was rather boasting of his own moral and religious accomplishments. Instead of comparing himself with God's perfect standards and seeing how sinful he really was, he compared himself to others in the, in the community and prided himself on being better than they were. Listen again how often he used the word I in his prayer and how it revealed that the true state of his heart was that of conceit and self-sufficiency. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. As you can see, his prayer was just a narcissistic description of who he wasn't and a list of religious acts that he had accomplished. In no way was this the kind of persistent prayer that depended on God for one's needs. This was self-adulation, giving all the credit to self and none to God. The tax collector's prayer, on the other hand, was a striking contrast. Standing before God, he felt unworthy, broken, dependent, and separate. He would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but striking his chest, he cried out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And literally, literally, this means the sinner. See, he didn't think of himself as one sinner among many, but as the sinner who was unworthy of anything from God. 
So do you see the difference between the two prayers? The Pharisee thought he was praying to God. The tax collector, however, looked to the door and raised his voice to heaven. The Pharisee was proud and confident. The tax collector grieved over his own condition as a sinner. The Pharisee described his righteousness. The tax collector begged for mercy to escape the judgment his sin deserved. So, let me ask again, who do you think really prayed? We have a tendency to think our prayers are answered in direct proportion to how many times we've been to church, how many times we've had devotions, how many times we've tithed or given an offering. But nothing is further from the truth. Prayer isn't based upon merit. It's based upon mercy. That's what this sinner discovered. And once you learn this lesson, prayer will become a joy to you as well. Notice that the tax collector made no excuses for his sin. He came in total humility and simply said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't defend himself, explain his sin, justify his rebellion, or vow to do better in the future. All too often, we come before the Lord and only say, forgive me, but I promise that I'll never do it again. When I make those kind of promises, I'm expressing a confidence in my flesh that will prove to be an embarrassment to me down the road. I can't promise not to sin again. Like the tax collector, I must simply ask the Father to have mercy on me. Well, there's no doubt in Jesus' mind who truly prayed. The sinful tax collector went down to his house justified before God. He was made righteous and clean. He was now prepared for temple worship and his sins were forgiven. The Pharisee, though, left the temple confident he had fulfilled his religious duty, but still burying his own guilt and sins. He really hadn't prayed because he never addressed God. He wasn't forgiven because he never confessed his sins. He wasn't clean or qualified for worship because he remained separated from God by his unconfessed sin. So the lesson is clear. Those who come to God with authentic humility, with a spirit of self-humiliation and repentance will find God favorable and acceptable. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case with the Pharisee because his prayer revealed his pride, his arrogance, and his unrepentant heart, which led Jesus to repeat an important principle that's found three other times in the Bible. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, if you want to look up those other three times, they're in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. James chapter 4, verse 6, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. And once you understand that it's based solely on mercy, prayer becomes total pleasure. And when the answers come and the blessings are released and things begin to happen, guess who gets the glory? That's right, God does. He gets all the glory, the praise, and the adoration. You can't take the credit of your spirituality or discipline because in all reality, you have none. What you have has been given to you by God. Thus, you should simply glorify God with humility and a great appre appreciation as you stand in awe of His answer to your prayer and His work in your life. Now, in the next couple passages we'll be reading next, Jesus' lesson shifts from parables to an actual incident that occurred as he made his way to Jerusalem. So once again, let's go back to Luke chapter 18 and read from verse 15. Luke chapter 18, verse 15. People were bringing infants to him so that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus, however, invited them. Let the little children come to me and don't stop them. 
because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Here the Lord gives more insight on what the kingdom of God will be like. Now, this particular in incident reinforces what the Lord taught in the previous passage. Namely, that the humility of a little child is necessary for the entrance into the kingdom of God. In a time and place that was plagued by infant illness and death, parents brought infants and their children for Jesus to heal. The disciples, though, they didn't like this. They were annoyed by this intrusion into the Savior's time and took it upon themselves to send the parents away so that Jesus could focus on more important matters. Well, the Lord didn't like this. When he realized that, or when he realized what was going on, he immediately put a stop to it. He said, this ain't happening. He then held his arms open invited the little children to come to him and declared that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. This goes to show that God's ways are different from men's ways and how he deals with the little ones, the unknown ones, the powerless ones. While the world seeks people of power, influence, and wealth, God seeks children. And he seeks them out for a couple of reasons. One reason is that his kingdom is built on their childlike characteristics, trust, love, and innocence. In heaven, everyone will trust implicitly, love unconditionally, and be innocent eternally. And the second reason he seeks them out is that God wants children whom he can make into disciples. Children can absolutely understand the gospel and they can be saved at a tender age. Now, of course, that age may vary from child to child, but nevertheless, any child, no matter how young, who wishes to come to Jesus should be permitted to do so and encouraged in his faith. Jesus then went a shocking step further in verse 17 by essentially saying that one must receive the kingdom of God like a little child to enter it. Childlikeness isn't just one possible way among others to be part of Christ's kingdom. Being like a child is the only way to kingdom living. Now this doesn't mean that one must naively believe everything and anything but one must trust in Jesus undoubtedly, as a child would trust a parent or other responsible adult. Such a child doesn't ask for an adult's credentials or inquire into his or her parents' qualifications. He or she is ju just recognizes the authority and the ability, ability of the parent intuitively. This final verse also shows us that little children don't need to become adults in order to be saved, but adults do need to be born again in order to enter God's kingdom. Otherwise, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Now I'll get back to that verse in just a minute, but in these three passages we just read, Jesus tells us about three groups of people, often in contrast. The poor widow and powerful judge, the self-righteous Pharisee and the humble tax collector, and the helpless children and the disciples. Through these two parables and the one meeting, we learned important lessons about persistence in prayer, God's desire to help, the danger of faith disappearing from the earth before the Son of Man returns, the meaning of humble prayer as opposed to proud boasting, and the necessity of becoming like a child to enter the kingdom. Thus, these lessons are meant to urge us to have a life that persists in faith and prayer, and to maintain a childlike attitude of trust and hope. 
the vitality of prayer and faith will result in rewards here and in the hereafter. And it will bring us to praise God and to give Him all the honor and all the glory. So let me ask you, are you ready to receive the kingdom of God? If you believe that you are, and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Him into your heart. Wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head, and if you're able to, get on your knees, and then pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. With the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, if you prayed that simple prayer, then welcome to the kingdom of God. Your sins are washed away and you are now born again. So let us know about it. Contact us. You can go to our website. You can fill out that, that form on the bottom of our website and you can tell us through our various social media pages. We have Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Let us know that you prayed that. Maybe we can help you find a church wherever you're located. But if you're here in El Paso, we want to invite you to come check us out. This new Christian life of yours is going to have its ups and downs. So you're going to need people around you to help you, to pray for you, to encourage you. That's what the church does. That's what the church is. So again, what we want to do is just help you in those first steps. I hope that this lesson about the persistent widow showed you the importance of always praying, to never stop praying. I hope that the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector showed you the importance of humility. That when you come before God, you've got to recognize who you really are in comparison to Him. And that because of His great love for you, because of His mercy, you are now His child. Not because of anything you've done or any accomplishments. It's simply because of His grace. And lastly, I hope that this story of the children coming to Jesus has shown you the importance of having a childlike faith, a faith that trusts, a faith that loves, and a faith that is innocent. Because the kingdom of God belongs to those who have a childlike faith. I hope all of you have a blessed week. As I did last week, I'll be praying for you this upcoming week that God will use you to bring others into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, whether it be by your words or by your actions. Never forget, you're His child now, and He loves you very much. Have a great and blessed week, and I look forward to seeing what the Lord has in store for us next week. We'll see you soon. Bye.